Hello there, everyone. Welcome to our session for today. We're really excited to start today's listening session and welcome to our discussion on AI in education and the future of assessment. Um, I'd like to share um, that we will be recording today's session and sharing it with you all afterwards um, for anyone that registered. Uh, I would also like to let you know that we do have the live transcript option available if you would like captioning. That should be in either the top or the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. You'll be able to click enable live transcription that will let you have captioning throughout today's session. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Christina Ishmael, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Education Technology. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm joining you from the West Coast today while I am normally on the East Coast. So um, forgive me while I'm still consuming my uh, second cup of coffee here. Um, we are so delighted that you're interested in this topic and are joining us for this listening session. Um, while you as attendees do not have the opportunity to turn your, your cameras on, um, please know that the active chat that has been happening in these sessions is being captured and we hope that you contribute to the conversation through chat. Um, so please go ahead and tell us your name and about yourself in the chat to make sure that we can um, see who's represented today. Um, next slide. So our perspective here at the Office of Ed Tech at the U.S. Department of Education is we know that we are staying grounded in the current practices within classrooms and within our states, but we're also keeping an eye on the horizon. And we know that AI in education is already in classrooms, and you'll hear about that from Jeremy. Um, but it is really important for us to think about the guardrails and the guidelines around AI in education. And so what we're seeing right now is that there are definitely strong synergies between formative assessment and ed tech. Um, I, I really want to focus in on formative assessment for everyone's knowledge here. That's what you're going to hear our panelists and our, our experts talk about today. We are not discussing high stakes accountability by any means or summative um, assessment. So if that is what you were hoping to hear, please know that we're going to really focus on formative assessment that drives our teaching and learning in, in our classrooms. We also know that AI can broaden what we measure, um, enabling more personalized experiences for teachers. We've had other, um, other listening sessions where we said, you know, it could really support our teachers in helping them further personalize that experience and give more experiential learning for learners like I did whenever I was teaching early childhood and elementary education with my multilingual learners in Omaha, Nebraska. And that was, that was always the goal. So that's what we want to continue to see. Um, so we know that we're going to continue to see the like that next generation of AI enhanced formative assessments grow. And so how can we think about that from the policy perspective here at the US Department of Education. Next slide please. Back in uh, the beginning of 2022, Secretary Cardona um, released his priorities um, that we're focused on here at the department and this administration. And three of them that we see that are aligned to this work that we're doing in, in AI and education is really looking at equity, of course, um, and that being the center of, of so many things that we're doing. Uh, we've seen the inequities over the past few years be exacerbated through the pandemic. And so how can we think about these technologies to address address the equity needs of our learners and learner variability? And then how can we make the job of teaching better? We know that we have severe shortages when it comes to teachers right now. We do not want to replace teachers, but we want to think about how AI and ed tech can help support our teachers. And then we, of course, want to think about strengthening our career pathways. So we know the connections between P-12, higher education, and workforce. And that is the charge of our office is to develop that national ed tech policy for that entire spectrum of learner, because we want everywhere all the time learning, no matter your age. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So our formative assessment interests are broad. Just so you know, we're going to cover a lot in our 90 minutes together. Um, we will take a little kind of break to change our state, and I will lead that because the teacher and me cannot help but do that. Um, but just know that we are thinking about these types of questions. Um, I don't need to read them to you. You can see them on the screen. Um, but know that we're going to we're going to talk about these things. If you have questions and initial and other thoughts, please contribute those to. Um, um, the chat, and hopefully we will be able to address those with our experts that will be here in the room. 
I am not an expert in this field. And so that's why I'm here. That's why we're doing these listening sessions to learn from the folks that are in this work. We are in listening mode to help develop the policy that we will put out um, as a country. And you will probably hear this as well, but people are looking to the US to understand what we're doing about this in the policy space. We need to make sure that we are responsibly designing the, the technologies and the tools to keep our students safe, but also to provide access to incredible technologies. So please know that that's kind of where we're coming from at the beginning of this. Um, our next slide here, <clears throat> excuse me, is just kind of a um, thing that we're going to, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Jeremy here. We will launch into the conversation. We will have you engage with us. We have some, some opportunities for some polls and, and adding some questions. So please contribute to the conversation. We're excited that you're here and Jeremy, take it away, please. Thanks, Christina. Uh, as you can see, I direct learning sciences research at Digital Promise, and I want to extend my welcome to the over 200 participants who have joined us today. It's, a, it's just wonderful to see the turnout for this listening session. As we talk about formative assessment, I want to start with something that really opened my eyes many, many years ago. It was stated by John Bransford. There was a nice celebration of John Bransford's life this past weekend, and it got me thinking about John. And here's the thing John said that was so provocative. provocative. Gabrielle, next slide. How could assessment be a gift? Well, if we go to the next slide, Gabrielle, um, you know, formative assessment should be a gift. I, it, it hurts my brain sometimes to say assessment and gift in the same sentence, but when we open up an, uh, our formative assessment, it should make our learning and teaching better. It should make us feel better about our strengths, better able to learn. It should empower our teaching. So what's your reaction to this concept of assessment as a gift? What does it make you think of? We'd love to hear from you in chat. And let's go to the next slide. But it's not where we are today with routine formative assessments. Uh, one of our panelists today is Dragan, the last author of this wonderful open source paper. Um, and he observes in the paper that formative assessments today can be onerous for the teacher and students. It can feel inauthentic. It can feel impersonal. It can be deficit, not asset oriented. And it can be very discrete moments, not yet fully integrated into systems of assessment that are continuous. And so we're not there yet. So what could we do to get there? I want to put a positive spin on this. Um, there's lots of research on formative assessment technology and teaching and learning, and it's really positive. Here's a study I helped read, and it was about innovation in how we do homework. Homework is not a gift most of the time, um, but this study showed that assistments, a technology out of Worcester Polytech, could give students instant feedback as they did homework, and that made homework a better experience for students. And for teachers, it gave reports like the one shown, which could really help the teacher know where to focus their support for students. And we showed on the next slide that this not only was using assessments at scale beneficial to students, but it was especially beneficial for students with low prior math achievement who saw bigger gains in their math scores than did for those at the higher end. So that was really exciting. Now, I would say assessments was a low AI system at the time we tested it, but overall we're seeing the capabilities of AI expanding super rapidly now. That study was completed around 2015. Um, look at the hockey stick shape of the growth in AI publications. This would be patents, number of people in the field. AI is just you know, expanding every day. And we're seeing it in our lives in things like personal assistance, mapping applications, recommendation engines, and more. Next slide. Here's another bold, provocative claim to get us uh, started this morning. We really think AI and assessment need each other. AI has a lot of issues around fairness, bias, cultural sensitivity, and more. Well, assessment has been working those issues for decades. Those have come up forever when we're dealing with fielding assessments. So AI needs the smarts that the assessment field has about these issues. On the flip side, assessment has been narrow and assessment needs AI's ability to more broadly sense what students know and can do 
and more useful input and recommendations to teachers and students. So we're really ex excited today to explore how these things relate and how we could go from assessments that are inconvenient, not valuable enough to students and teachers. And this issue of trust looms large. It's really important that assessments be trustworthy. We think we can go towards assessments that are much less burden that students and teachers champion because they find them useful and that are widely viewed as trustworthy. That's where we want to head. Okay, thanks for listening to my intro. We're going to have conversations about the greatest opportunities for AI to enhance assessment, greatest opportunities for assessment experts to help us make AI unbiased, and how do we get to make sure teachers and students are in the loop. And with that, we're going to start to invite our panel. Wonderful. We are joined by five incredible folks today. Um, so excited to learn from them today and learn alongside. Um, we like to keep it rather informal, but know that these folks are really, really good and smart, smart people. So um, we're going to have each one of them come on and, and give us a brief introduction to who they are and what they're looking forward to in this conversation. So I'm just going to go based off of the, the slide here. Um, Diego, can I have you come on and uh, tell us a little bit about who you are? Hello, I'm Diego. I'm a distinguished presidential appointee and the director of a center at ETS, and the center is called LAFI. And LAFI stands for Learning Assessment Foundations and Innovations. Great. Thanks so much. To Alina. Yeah, Alina, thank you. We need your camera, Andre, too. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Alina von Davier. I'm Chief of Assessment with Duolingo and I lead the R&D division for the Duolingo English test and other assess language assessment. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful, thanks so much. Dragan? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dragan Gashic. I'm Professor in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, where I'm also leading the Center for Learning Analytics. Look forward to today's conversation. Thank you. And we and are so, so grateful for you to stay up so late and join us today. Um, I'm so early. <laughs> or so early, you're right. <laughs> um, Sarah and then Janice. Hi all, um, I am a math and science teacher for middle and high schools by trade. I've been in the classroom for 15 years. Um, this year, I'm excited to transition into a new role as a technology and curriculum specialist for the district I grew up in. I'm also a longtime member of Educator Circles, where we think about how the learning sciences and educational technologies benefit teachers and learners. And I've been thinking especially about artificial intelligence, so I'm really glad to be here today. Great. And Janice? Hi, I'm Janice Gobert. I'm a professor at Rutgers in uh, learning sciences and educational psychology. Um, I'm also CEO of a company uh, that co-developed Inkits, that's Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System for Science, and it's Teacher Dashboard Ink Water, and I'm really happy to be here today. Wonderful. As you can tell, we have some incredible folks here. Um, I'm going to start us off with question number one, um, where we're thinking about our opportunities. We wanna think about those asset-based and, and always framing things through the opportunities here. So where do you see big payoffs for AI-enhanced assessments for students, for teachers, for parents? Will AI systems be better able to measure what matters, make assessment less painful, make the results much more useful to improving learning? So I'm going to start with Janice and then send it over to Sarah after that. Janice, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I think that's a really important question. I think it's key to why we're all here, right? Stakeholders. Um, so just a, a, a little bit, you know, uh, about Jeremy's uh, intro that AI affords an opportunity that's very different from multiple choice tests. Multiple choice tests were conceptualized when we had a, a much coarser grained understanding of human learning. Jeremy um, mentioned uh, John Bransford. You know, John Bransford was an absolute pioneer and um, wrote a series of books, co-wrote a series of books called um, how people learn. And we know so much more about this. It behooves us to include 
um, processes of learning, processes of comprehension, problem solving exactly in the design of our intelligent tutoring systems in our AI systems. So just a little bit about um, AI, AI tracks everything a student's doing. So every mouse click, every change to a simulation, for example, every uh, change to a widget, everything they write, time on task, etc. So it's extremely fine grained. That's just under the cognitive realm. There's a whole bunch of um, social emotional um, characteristics that it can tra trace as well, but I'm not going to speak about that right now. So AI affords us the opportunity to track uh, students. And because we can track them, we can actually react in real time. So the benefits for students are absolutely incredible, right? Students don't not want to necessarily raise their hand. They may not even know when they need help. So if you have AI that's fine grained and very rigorous in the background, it can jump in when students are working in real time, blending learning and assessment. It can help them in ways that they don't even know they need, right? So that's, um, that's very unprecedented and definitely a feature of AI that we need to leverage. Also, I mean, um, I think that uh, we can measure students' trajectories as they're developing their learning processes. And that's where it's really helpful for teachers in terms of formative instruction. Because we're measuring what students do and we're not just relying on what they write, students who are say ELLs, students who are not good at writing, um, can be assessed with regard to the full competency. Now, most of my comments, by the way, are coming from science because I um, developed, helped co-develop a system for science called Inkits. Um, so we also know that uh, a system can track students' trajectories in a very fine-grained way. So those who are on uh, IEPs, those who are in special education, those who are not good at describing what they know in words. Many STEM students, STEM concepts are, first of all, very spatial in nature, but many students who are very good at STEM are sometimes not very good at describing what they know in words. So, so AI provides that opportunity for students. For That's teachers, great, Janice. I think let's go over to Sarah now and open it up to a teaching perspective on some of the wonderful insights you've had about learning. Sarah? Yeah, so um, I think AI really does have the opportunity to transform uh, assessment, when we assess, how we assess, what we assess. And I'm super glad that we're taking this opportunity to focus on formative assessment um, because we know that that's one of the most powerful tools in the teacher's toolkit. Um, feedback in, in particular has been shown to uh, overcome many other factors in the student's life. And it's, um, it's something that's not well utilized. So I'm really excited that we're talking about formative assessment. And I think that AI is positioned to help us with that. Uh, but before I get into how, I kind of want to give you an overarching vision for how I see this potentially working. Um, I want AI to help me do what I do best. Uh, I want to partner with it to maximize what we're each really good at. So for example, the technology is well suited to that fine grained data uh, analysis that Janice was talking about, pattern finding, automated suggestions, but humans are well suited to discernment. Um, we're well suited to discern the outcomes of that and then to figure out how we can use that to understand, value, protect, and empower the students um, because we are the ones that have the capacity for moral reflection and empathy. Um, so in other words, I want the AI to help me really quickly and easily see what my student needs in their learning journey, but then I want to be the one to intervene as a caring human and do something about that. So because of that, when I talk about AIs, I'm always going to be talking about explainable AIs with humans in the loop, uh, ones that very uh, intentionally balance, like you were talking about, Janice, that it is that um, they are collecting data on everything the student's doing all the time, and that could be distorted very easily into sort of a surveillance culture. So we have to be careful about how we're implementing and designing those things to balance the risks with the potential payoffs. So there are four things I want I want you to think about as you develop your policy, and I'm happy to go into more depth with any of these, but I'm just going to give them out there broadly right now. Um, first is I really want to go toward concept integrated assessments that can analyze really messy and complex cognitive domains. Um, we have too long focused on these sort of segmented skill based things and what I would rather see are are the skills that humans will always need, no matter how advanced technology gets, 
um, we are always going to need to uh, develop skills like creativity, collaboration, dialogue, argumentation, inquiry, design, affect, self-regulation. Um, so I wanna move towards that with the way that we assess. I also wanna go towards more authentic assessments. So rather than some of that uh, multiple choice you're talking about, there's a really great quote that said that traditional assessments are designed around what is easy to measure instead of what is important to measure. And so with uh, something more complex and sophisticated, I'm really hoping that we can get at what is uh, important to measure instead of what is easy. Last two, towards less formal value added feedback. Um, instead of that like deficit finding, like let's measure what you don't know, let's measure what you do know and how can we leverage that? And then last but not least, I'd like it to become more of that blended towards stealthy ongoing assessment. Terrific. We have time now to open this up to what we're seeing in chat and to what our panelists are thinking. So I'd invite any of the panelists to come on and share their thoughts to add to this or something they're seeing in chat that they think is a really important idea to bring into the conversation. I can um, mention some of the things that I see in the chat. And so people agree with the idea of having teachers uh, take uh, or, or give teachers power over what's uh, going on and and having uh, like the, they're mentioning feedback as an important aspect. Um, I, I also want to mention that so in terms of uh, having providing insights to teachers, as I think is a, a big opportunity. We, uh, in terms of uh, AI, being able to capture data from different uh, <laughs> contexts. What's going on? So being able to capture more about the context in which these assessments are used um, and providing <laughs> insights to teachers so they can actually make, make decisions that, that can help uh, students. Um, so I, I see that uh, assessments that are flexible, that can be embedded in learning and know about the context can provide that kind of uh, support for and, and opportunities. Diego, I just want to thank you for bringing in context, and I want to acknowledge that in our chat, Broer Saxberg, I mentioned that that's one of the really keys here. Go ahead, Alina. I'm sorry to get in your way. Oh, that's a good sequence because uh, sequel because I wanted to address Broer uh, point about context. So I think aligning the feedback that uh, Diego mentioned, al aligning the feedback for students with the feedback that we can give to the teachers and including context in that recommendation can be quite powerful. So I think this but obviously it does require quite a lot of work in developing it. So uh, I definitely agree both with Diego and with uh, Broer about context and feedback. I think the integration could be key here. Perhaps another thing that I would like to add is this idea of a holistic assessment. It also includes context to some extent. Could assessments also include parts of what makes us successful? For example, could we include something about confidence? How confident are you that this response is correct? We, in my previous work, we built a system called HERA, Holistic Educational Research and Assessment, where we, it was a STEM a science tool for middle school. And we were experimenting with providing feedback uh, to students at different levels, and then asking them, how confident are you that these responses are appropriate? We know that there are, uh, especially for minorities, that uh, they tend to be less confident uh, in their responses, and often they are correct. So we want to make sure that we help everyone calibrate with that. So I think, again, AI can help a little more with than just the uh, cognitive side in uh, that is being taught and assessed uh, in the usual classroom. Can I add something to Alina's comment? 
Uh, I think I, I think that's a great comment with res, with respect to confidence. But I think that AI is very useful in this regard because if a student doesn't need to raise their hand to get help and they don't have to show that they messed up, they're perhaps much more willing to engage in sort of flexible thinking, creative thinking, because a lot of learning is based on trial and error. And AI, uh, machine learning in particular, is very, very good at letting a, letting a student uh, explore and then you decide when it is you want to perhaps remediate, right? You can build that into your algorithms. Whereas, you know, older systems are really trying to force students through a lockstep process and students may be unwilling to engage in that for fear that they would be incorrect. So I just wanted to add that. Definitely, and you brought the word engagement. This is another area where we can definitely do more. Um, we know that keeping everyone engaged helps them be more receptive to what's being taught. And we also know that these new technologies can actually help us keep the students engaged. And I think this is something that can be utilized for all these systems that are um, including assessment as part of the system in the classroom. Yeah, can I add something here as well? And I, I'm seeing, uh, I, I really appreciate both points Alina and Janice are adding here with respect to the kind of uh, engagement, with respect to the role of AI and everything, and also looking at some of the comments as well popping up in the chat as well with respect kind of measurement of the discussion, discourse, or I'd say basically AI is really good promising technology that can help us measure learning processes in general. Uh, uh, whether we are talking about cognitive, metacognitive, or other affective uh, processes that are relevant there. And to me, why these type of processes are really interesting and relevant is because they are much more emphasizing the formative nature of the assessment. They are much more also leaning towards supporting feedback that is going to inform learners how to think about next task how to improve for the next learning. Because in the end of the day, if you are getting some of these assessments and especially feedback, and there's no future application of that feedback where we can see how learners are improving or progressing in that process, then that feedback is not particularly useful. And that's basically part of that kind of dialogic feedback uh, process that is promoted in the literature by the authors such as David Bald or David uh, Carlos. So to me, that's one important thing. But the other thing that we don't I do so well, at least I, I'd say, is that we don't know how to turn that assessed information uh, into effective feedback to the students in an automated way. And often we basically do some of these things. They work really well in the labs. But when we go into the wild, some of these things don't work so well or so effectively. And often because we offer some suggestions to the learners how to adopt new learning strategies, and they don't find it particularly useful. So I think there's far more work still left there for to understand how we can better engage the learners. And in whether we are talking about different types of co-design and other types of opportunities to create something that can actually be helpful and they will be adopting as well as part of their learning. Um, I'd like to add to that, Dragon. I think um, you know systems that react in real time uh, via digital agent can be quite productive. Uh, we have shown that in our work, for example. It is the case, however, that some students who would like to game the system and just get the bottom out hint might avoid what in our system Rex is saying. And so when we interviewed teachers, uh, one teacher in particular, particular was saying, you know, the students are complaining about Rex. And then she thought about it. She said, all the kids who are complaining about Rex are kids who don't really want to engage in deep learning. So she said to them, you know, if you don't like Rex popping up, read what Rex is saying and follow his advice and try to engage in the science activity that Rex is suggesting. Give the, use the help that he's giving you and then Rex won't pop up. Well, it was actually fairly miraculous. Kids were like, oh, what? I should do what I'm told. <laughs> and they, they really learned from Rex in this case. And we showed quite robust learning and quite robust transfer up, tested up to 180 80 days. So I think it's really key you know, having that rigorous information, giving it, making it meaningful for the student, 
uh, the feedback needs to be meaningful. And then also giving the teacher those meaningful uh, data and alerts as to who needs help, what kind of help they need, and then some scripts to help uh, support and bridge that gap especially because in, again, from, from a science perspective, the national, national uh, next generation science standards are focused on practices and most science teachers have been focused solely on the content. But what is more transferable is actually support around the practices. So those are two ways in which I think we can build effective feedback. Uh, great teacher alerting dashboards that identify who's uh, struggling, what they're struggling at. And then, of course, a digital agent that's at the right level of specificity for where the student needs help. Thanks so much, Janice. Do you, do you have something quick you want to get in, Diego? Because we're about ready to go to our next question. Yeah, just one comment about the importance of uh, co-designing, especially in terms of equity and knowing the cultures of, of the students and, and the realities of the classroom. So these tools need to, to be aware of situations and provide those insights within that context so they can be adopted and, and implemented in this environment. Thank you. Hey, this has been just a terrific start to our discussion. And in our chat, our audience is pushing us towards our second question because it's not all roses, it's not all upsides. We, with all the applications of AI and education, we have to be super attentive, attentive to bias and fairness. And as I said, assessment's been dealing with this, these issues for ages. So we want to hear what you think those challenges are with regard to fairness, accountability, transparency, explainability, ethics in assessment. And do we have a shot of addressing them here? What would that look like? So I'm gonna start with Dragon. What do you what do you think about these issues? Uh, thanks so much, Jeremy. That that's a terrific question. Obviously, I'm uh, just before I kind of dive into some of these issues. I want to kind of declare my bias as well, and that I'm a computer scientist. I'm quite excited about the use of AI and some of these things. But at the same time, we always have to be mindful of some of these issues and the potential damage as well that we uh, can create. So Jeremy was kind enough to mention the paper that we recently uh, published in Computer Science Education AI. And in that paper, in addition to some opportunities for the use of AI for assessment, we also indicated several uh, potential issues that could be threatening and how AI can be also doing potential harm in some of the process. So some of these issues are related to, for example, slime lining of professional expertise. And mm. uh, often uh, that process kind of me in a way that we can, as educators, be fairly uh, tempted to, in a way, too much trust to automate a decision making that AI might be doing, especially with respect to cheating or some other practices. It's very convenient and many schools or higher education institutes today have plagiarism detection tools and these tools might be actually offering some of these insights, but at the same time, these insights might not be correct always. And we need to, as educators, be thinking about some of these issues, what they mean, rather than just taking them as the kind of the whole truth and the only truth that could be out there. My perspective to that is that explainable AI, in particular, that is combined with certain kind of embed embedding of good professional learning and teaching practices can be very beneficial there to promote uh, like, you know, reflective practice as part of the process of uh, the use of AI in, in such situations. There's another problem that I think we often uh, think about or benefit of AI we think about. And there's general kind of myth, if you wish, that AI somehow can provide us as a neutral arbiter of the universal truth and the correctness and things are going to be really well done if we delegate just all our assessments to that objective uh, like non-human entity who is going to do great things. But the thing is that somebody, some other human being created that AI assessment. Those would be often learning engineers, obviously psychometricians, also AI engineers and so on. And so in a way, what we need to basically pay attention to that, that, that kind of convenient thinking that AI is going to do that kind of good job for us is really uh, not 
quite there. So my kind of point there is that although AI can be very beneficial there in those situations, we really need to think about um, uh, what is the rigorous oversight uh, when we are delegating assessment to some of the issues uh, that are related to AI and who is accountable for some of these assessment issues. One final point I'm gonna mention, although I, I can speak about some of these issues here, is general question that came up also in previous, I think Sarah made a remark as well about the general kind of surveillance pedagogy and general surveillance culture that AI might be promoting. And that was when one of the reasons why I initially came to study learning analytics and artificial intelligence education is that kind of convenience of understanding how people are engaging with their learning and everything else. And that's very appealing, but at the same time, by its nature is almost a very surveillance type of approach. And so the key question then there is that we need to think about being transparent as part of that process, being clear as well in which kind of activities some of the data is captured and how it's utilized. At the same time, also thinking about um, really uh, rather than using that kind of uh, data as the judgment or the evaluation to focus much more on the development and to turn it into a kind of a developmental feedback as an opportunity to learn more rather than to kind of basically further uh, uh, aggravate potentially text anxiety or even discourage learners to participate in some of these types of activities. Perhaps even to critically think about the assessment that was provided to them through AI. So that's basically the final point I wanna make. I can continue talking about these issues, but I'm gonna probably uh, hand it over to Alina who may have many other good points. Yes, thank you, Dragon. And definitely I concur with all of your points. So based on my experience, perhaps I would look at uh, the similar points, but from a different perspective. And the perspective is more from a doer and builder. So one observation and recommendation I would like to make is to look at AIs as very advanced and useful tools. So not as agents, but as tools that have been created by other humans. And what I mean by that is to have make sure that they are embedded into a larger system. This is when we talk about assessment, for example, and where we want to have different AI components contribute to the assessment development uh, process or administration or security. It is much better uh, and easier to keep track of the impact of the AI tools if we embed these tools into what we call an ecosystem. So we wanna make sure that we have different theoretical frameworks working smoothly with the say sophisticated delivery platforms. We wanna make sure that the test security um, approach is actually embedded in the assessment and it's not only in assessment design and it's not only based on surveillance, for example. Um, so we want to bring a lot of this components up front in the design process and in that way making sure that when we evaluate the fairness of the whole system then together the AI with uh, the human contribution are evaluated against the same criteria. Another recommendation that I would have is again as Dragon mentioned we AI requires really a high level of expertise. And that creates a bit of a problem because this is a new field for all of us and it's quite technical and it requires a lot of um, development for psychometricians, for test developers, but also for teachers. And in order to be critical of something, you need first to understand it to some extent. And of course, this is why we are all here to work together. Nobody can learn everything. <laughs> so I would suggest that we request uh, and expect more uh, efficacy studies, third party research of, um, that should accompany 
those processes and those tools that say teachers will decide to use in the classroom. Again, I think parents should request that as well. So let's take a look. Did another company or another institution look at these results? Is there any evidence based on data that indeed this particular tool does what it claims to do? Uh, I think a bit, and that's related to responsibility as well. So I think more clarity in expectations, and this could come from institutions like, like yours here, um, have requesting efficacy research uh, that's conducted by third party, additional transparency and methodologies on what data was used to train this these fancy, sophisticated models. What evidence do we have that the developers took into account the multitude and diversity uh, of our students into account when they put together those training data? So all of this needs to be documented, from my, in my opinion, and I think we should ask for that. Um, Another point I would like to make is, again, related to the first, let's not forget that these fantastic tools are tools. So the teacher is super important in this context. We need the human in the loop part for the classroom. And we need to teach the teacher to be involved and critical of, um, of the recommendations from this tool. So I think if the teacher sees that as a helper, I think a lot of, um, of the final decision can be actually more, um, more reliable because the teacher in that way will have more information perhaps at the level it was never able to get before because it's very, it's much more um, fine grain. It's about the strategy, it's about the processes, it's about the social emotional learning. And all of that information can be put together with teachers' own observations in making those decisions. I do believe that the teachers do need to, to be the final uh, decision-making uh, in the classroom. So I believe <laughs> these issues are real, but I also believe that we have tools to address them. Yeah. Yeah. I will stop here and we can see what. Uh, yeah, what <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. And we're going to go to our first poll now. So I'm going to ask my colleague, Gabrielle, to bring this up. We're using poll everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, go to the URL here, pollev.com slash vils. And uh, we want to ask you first about um, opportunities to, to address these issues that our panelists have raised. And you'll both be able to put in what you think we can do to address these things, but you can also upvote. So if you see something you like, upvote it. And the ones that get the most upvotes are going to, to rise to the top. And so you can, you can see one in there at zero upvotes so far. And so we're gonna give this a chance to see where our participants, over 200 participants right now, where they think we ought to go. And we're gonna ask our panelists to comment on some of these. My colleague Patti might jump in at this point to help me uh, moderate this as well. Yes, so thank you, Jeremy. Video, um, Patti. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so in terms of where we see opportunities coming up, Diego, you talked a little bit about equity and, and uh, having these technologies fit where our students are located, so making sure that they fit in those environments. And you also think a lot about games embedded and embedded assessments. So I'm I'm wondering if you've noticed anything there that stands out to you that's come from the chat today or anything you're noticing here in this poll related to those two areas. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I can see that people um, have mentioned the importance of uh, using or, or keeping in mind the realities of, of the class So the idea of tools for teachers, enhancing teachers so they can make the decisions they want to make. And something I want to mention here is that these systems sometimes are seen as, as a black box kind of uh, situation where uh, predictions are made based on lots of data. But what we need is to have a clear view, clearly show how 
those recommendations or or, or those uh, interactions are made, what evidence is used or what data is used to be able to make those recommendations. So teachers and everyone involved know about why that kind of system is, is providing that type of information. So having um, open learning environment, open learning environments or open uh, or inspectable learner models or, or applications where where the stakeholders can understand how these systems make decisions or recommendations is going to be an important aspect in the future. Of Thank you, uh, Sarah. You talked a little bit about accountability um, and fairness in these AI systems. Is there anything you'd like to add from what you're seeing in chat or in, in the poll? Yeah, I just want to highlight some some themes that came up in chat about acknowledging that uh, no piece of technology is neutral, um, that it's always going to have the uh, the biases of the creator of whatever technology it is, and just being very transparent about that. Um, I think if we can acknowledge it, then we can safeguard against that in different ways. Um, and and and. Like Jeremy said earlier, this could also be a way that we can uh, potentially leverage AI to help combat some of those issues. But it does need to be acknowledged that uh, that our ideas about what counts as learning, about what counts as success, um, are definitely being encoded into what's being created. And so we have to wrestle with that first. I think if you put 10 educational professionals in a room, what they would say is most important to learn is going to be different. And so uh, just knowing that that's a piece of it and acknowledging that is going to be really important. Thank you, Sarah. Janice, anything that you're noticing here? Yeah, I wanted to react to the uh, comment, yes, if mindfully implemented, and I'm going to pick up on a few things that people have said. Um, so, you know, we need to um, have teachers, uh, treat teachers like the professionals they are, they know their students better than we do, clearly. So my, my point of view is we give them rigorous, well-operationalized data, and then they decide how to use it. So for example, if the teacher gets an alert that a student is um, seems to be floundering, and the teacher knows that that student, for example, frustrates easily, we don't know that, we can't know that, right? The teacher might say, okay, I'm gonna go over right away because I know so-and-so uh, frustrates very easily and they'll just shut down. If they, on the other hand, get an alert that a, a student is floundering and they know that that student is going to, has a lot of grit and might continue working hard at it, you know, they might just say, you know, I'm gonna hold off for a minute because I wanna emphasize, they know their students better than we know their students. And I want to also back up one second because earlier we talked a little bit about contextual information. And I do think contextual information is important, but I also think that the teacher understands the context. The teacher is using these, uh, these tools in a formative way and they know what's happened. They know if it's a Friday and it's an early Friday before a four day weekend, they know the kids are gonna be a little bit, you know, excited, perhaps not on task. So the teacher has that data. So I think rather than try to build the full universe of variables into our AI, which is going to affect uh, the validity and um, the validity of those algorithms, what we do is we focus on the phenomenon that are, are key to the construct we're looking at, and we give the teachers the data, and then the teachers use it very flexibly. That way they're a human in the loop. And again, as I said, they know their students far better than we know um, their students, right? So if a student's having a bad day and their performance looks like it's not typical, they can yeah. go over and say, hey, what's going on today? You know? Yeah, for sure. I, I'm thinking about all of this from the, the policy perspective as well, of course, on the funding mechanisms to ensure that we can provide the professional learning and that ongoing high quality uh, professional learning. And we're in the process of updating um, our most like 
highest uh, visited Dear Colleague letter to talk about funding for ed tech and professional learning is included in there. And so there will be a refresh that will be coming in the next couple of weeks talking about our relief dollars that have certainly helped with the billions of dollars that have been invested during the pandemic and thinking about sustainability beyond that. So using title um, one through four, as well as IDEA um, dollars to, to help fund ed tech and the, the software, the hardware, the devices, all of that. But the professional learning, we know that those have those have to come together. And so how do we interpret the data and, and these data that we're, we're getting to make sure that we're making those decisions um, appropriately and contextually, of course. Okay, so forget the policy wonkiness for a second. Um, we need a little bit of a brain break here. So please indulge me. Um, the former early childhood teacher in me, as well as the yogi, would like to do a little bit of deep breathing with you all today, just to give us a, just a moment to, to pause in the conversation um, and then change our, our states here and make sure that our, our two hemispheres are, are crossing the midline here. So we're just gonna cross our right arm over our left arm just like that, okay? You can do eagle arms if you can do it, if you're a yogi and you wanna do that. Um, it's difficult, so that's fine, just do that. And then we will do the opposite. So left arm on top of the right. And then we're gonna take a couple of deep breaths. So you can just put your hands on your thighs or your um, the center. Go ahead and close your eyes. We're gonna count in to two, one, two, and then out for two, one, two. We're gonna do that one more time. One, two, and out for two, one, two. Okay, thank you again for indulging. I really appreciate these moments when we get to break up the time where we're sitting and getting for so long. Um, so thank you so much. We're gonna jump back into questions then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back into the business here. Um, so question three is assessments do not stand alone. We recognize that, but play a role in continuously improving our processes and just the, the general teaching that we're in the instruction in our classrooms. Um, but they're not just tests. So how do people use reports um, thinking about that? What do we need to be thinking about the systems of assessment level as AI becomes part of these systems of improvement grounded in what students know and what they can do? So I'm going to start with Diego first on this, and then we'll pass it over to Janice. Okay, um, several aspects um, that come to mind when thinking about the processes and what what's going on in, in classrooms and situations in formal learning contexts um, I'm, I'm looking at the data that's generated in this in this context and, and how that data can be used to provide insights to teachers however the just uh, a dashboard that you put in front of teachers is not going to be enough and especially when the what we expect is teachers to monitor what's going on time uh, during uh, the time. So paying attention to what's going on and see if there is something or, or perhaps uh, receiving some alerts that could be useful. But however, designing, even though those are dashboards, they should be designed, taking into account the needs and uh, and, this, and the, the, the questions that people have the teach that teachers have so designing and evaluating dashboards to make sure that teachers understand the data the limitation data in a in appropriate ways also these systems these dashboards can be designed and, evalu and evaluated with students and parents so they so people don't rely on or, or Pay, give too much credit to to information that may not be uh, supported by by evidence or it's just based on one thing that happened once but having information about what happened in these environments in the future people will be interacting with lots of simulations environments that where data is going to be collected immersive environments uh, uh, environments where people will be uh, doing things and we can gather data 
but we have to make sure that people understand what does it mean, what are the insights, and uh, that's an important one. I also, uh, we have done work on an area that we call caring assessments, where we take into account a broader view of the learning cognitive aspects, but cognitive aspects, uh, aspects of the uh, context and the culture, and, and we think about how those insights could be, pro what kind of insights we can provide, and how to design tasks that can uh, be used in different situations. The importance of an evidence layer, so we can have a, a layer of evidence that we can use, and it can be inspectable, it can be uh, easy to to for, for learners to and teachers and parents to understand what's going on with these systems. And again, what has been mentioned in the past as uh, uh, late in, before human in the loop, uh, hybrid mm -hmm. models with information uh, from uh, the top down designing mm -hmm. these environments and also bottom up that uh, may using yeah. machine learning and other techniques. Yeah. And that's how we like to think of policy. <laughs> Top down, bottom up, we got to meet in the middle, right? We need educators that are part of that policy as well as joining us um, up here. I also, I just, as we're thinking about, we know that assessment is not standing alone by any means, but it is joining this system or this ecosystem of all of these other tools and platforms we're using. While we work for the U.S. Department of Education and we're not allowed to endorse content curriculum or platforms, I can say that um, some of these data that we're we're referring to that helps identify how many platforms or tools that are in current schools right now. We know there's about 1,400 platforms that a school is using on a monthly basis. That is significant. And that is about 74 platforms and tools that a student is using and 86 that a teacher is using just on a monthly basis. So we know that those, we all have to be we need the interoperability, we need them to be able to talk to one another and then be able to look at data and, and determine what is going to help us um, in our next phases of teaching and learning. Janice. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Diego. Um, so I think with respect to, um, I'm gonna say with respect to uh, AI, um, we need to do the things that are really onerous for teachers, right? Like grading, like automated grading. We need to be able to take that away from them if they want it taken away from them and free them up to do the things they like to do, which is teach, right? I think that's key. Now, with respect to dashboards, I think that um, a dashboard needs to be designed in concert with a teacher's needs so that it's pedagogically meaningful. So if you take the next generation science standards, for example, you could design a dashboard that alerts teachers as to students' difficulties aligned to the next generation science standards, right? So we did this with Inkblotter. We worked very closely with teachers funded by the National Science Foundation, funded by the US Department of Education SBIR program. And we designed a dashboard that was highly flexible for teachers so that they could make whole class decisions individual uh, support students individually or do a small group instruction. So the sensitivity can be set and uh, various parameters in the dashboard can be set. So the teacher can say, you know, alert me as things are happening, alert me by the practice. So if I'm focused on this individual practice in my class, say collecting data, and I get an alert that 80% of my kids are struggling, I stop the entire class to make better use of that teacher's time because the teacher can't possibly go around to 80% of their students and help them. Furthermore, students will be waiting in order to get that help, right? So the dashboard really needs to have data um, that will support teachers' practices in real time to be effective for formative assessment. Um, I think that you know it needs to allow us to make better inferences about students' knowledge as students' knowledge is developing. I think that's really key. We can get at that with um, authentic tasks that were, were mentioned. And I do think that AI provides us a, a really big opportunity. Now, again, 
Um, this is my field, so I am a little bit biased and I have um, patents in AI and so I am biased. I do believe in the technology. I think we can develop um, technology that is not biased if you develop it on diverse student sets. And then of course you validate and test it based on students who were not built, uh, used to build the original models. That, that's absolutely critical for us to do. I also think that, you know, nothing is perfect, right? Nothing is perfect. Human scoring is not perfect. We know that. Human scoring of open responses is not perfect. We have a lot of data on that. Multiple choice are not perfect. None of these things are perfect, and they, but they shed lights on perhaps, AI can shed light on uh, much more process data than any other technology that's out there. Um, I think we need to embrace it, especially formatively. Um, I think we need to use it not for high stakes decisions. We shouldn't be using AI at present to decide what college uh, students should go to. You know, the UK had this problem two years ago where they used, um, they used AI to predict what college a student should go to. As it turned out, it wasn't really an AI problem. It was actually a data aggregation problem, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and last closing comment that I wanna make is I think when you have algorithms that are um, grading student work, you know, with over 90% accuracy, you need to embrace those formatively. And imagine saying to a cancer patient, well, we have this, uh, we have this treatment in it, but it's only 95% effective. So we're not going to give it to you yet. We're going to wait. Sorry, Mr. Smith, you have to die. That's just wrong. That's just absolutely wrong. So I really think that we, especially formatively, we can embrace um, AI, but leave the teacher in the loop, give them the rigorous data that they need, and then let them help individual students with that data in mind, because again, they know their students better than we do. Thanks so much. <clears throat> do any of our other panelists want to jump in with some thoughts about systems and ecosystems of assessment, or should we go back here to Patti in a poll? Dragan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. We've been using this phrase human in the loop, which is really good and cool. But I would also like to uh, refer to the more recent development as well in kind of human-centered AI and the recent book that Ben Schneiderman published on the topic. He's a prominent human-computer interaction researcher, and he basically kind of advocates that that's really not the best way that we are actually doing that, because human the loop somehow implies immediately that human is out of the loop, and then we somehow need to fight for the human to get back into that loop. And instead, we should be basically saying that AI in the loop should be added there, where basically it's assumed that human is in the loop. And we are basically always having the teachers and the students as part of the process and the decision makers and thinking about the kind of emphasizing the human role in the whole uh, process. So that's maybe a bit of a semantics, but I think also it's potentially a changer as well in the way how we are making our conversations and the way how we are seeing the role of AI as part of the entire process. So to me, that's really one uh, uh, critical thing. The other critical thing that I probably say is that, you know, we need to acknowledge the extent to which AI in some of these situations can or may not be helpful. And what are the limits of AI in certain situations? Often we buy the algorithms or the assessment tools without really clear specification about the reliability of these systems. What are the tests done on what data sets were used and what is the reliability of these type of, and we always know that AI is never having perfect reliability. It's never 100%. And if somebody tells you it's 100%, you know that something's fishy going on there, right? That's number one. Somebody also in the comments indicated there that we should be measuring the bias in our data as well. And I think that would be also really helpful if these algorithms and the AI tools are coming with the specification as well, how bias was gauged and what kind of approaches were used to do that and under what kind of protected attributes as well, we were measuring that bias. To me, there are already a bunch of different metrics that are out there available in the AI research and also in research and artificial intelligence in education. And I wish 
when we are making these decisions, we are actually informing these decisions by understanding the limits of those. I often get frustrated when some of these sports are introducing AI type of tools, like, for example, long jumping, whether you know, long jumpers are basically overreaching or not when they are actually at the jumping line. There was a recent controversy at the, in the World Championship as well about that. And there's no room for the human. And also there's no acknowledgement that that technology might not be 100% reliable. So I want to flag there. And I think it's really important if you are kind of integrating these type of things into the practice and in the context. Terrific. Perhaps to add and or continue that conversation, well, we probably, I mean, talking about nomenclatures, we call it artificial intelligence. But truly, at the moment, it's there are more tools than particularly intelligent. Now, it also would be fair to say that, yes, the machines are not perfect and they are not 100% reliable. Neither are humans. And we should remember that as well. So ideally, we should take advantage of the strength of each of the two. So, you know, the machines have strength and especially on scalability and speed and uh, level of details, um, humans, and especially in this case, teachers have definitely different strengths. They bring in the context to a much better degree than AI could ever do it. Uh, and they can uh, evaluate multiple options and make decisions. So. Again, I, I believe that the secret here that would help us move along uh, in a more efficient way and more compassionate way is to integrate uh, different capabilities with what we have had in the in place with human teacher-led education. So um, again, I'm for the integration and I would like to to expand that also in terms of data management, in terms of assessment and content alignment. So content and um, assessment and learning content alignment and how the assessment and feedback and how this feedback loop is closed through um, support learning and, and the role of the teacher in, in all of this. Again, looking at it as a system with AI components, um, I believe that can help us move forward in a safe way. So we have covered a tremendous amount of terrain and really, right, right, Christina, what are you thinking here? Yeah, we've really, we've really, we've really gotten a lot of the issues out there, but this is about policy and policy is about recommendations. What can we do? <laughs> it's about looking forward. Uh, we're, we're really grateful today that the Department of Ed represented by Christina, but also we have Bernadette Adams on the line. And we know there are many people beyond you at the department listening. And so let me invite Pati to pose a question. We're going to start with everyone in the room involved. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Pati, why don't you pose this question? We're moving towards action. What can we do? Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, I'm excited to hear what our participants are thinking in terms of what policymakers and educational leaders can start doing now to advance a focus on AI supporting formative assessment. And I want to turn it over first to Sarah. So Judy is going to drop a link in the chat for all our poll everywhere um, so that participants can start uh, adding their thoughts and upvoting. Uh, thank you, Judy. But um, before, as, as participants are adding their thoughts, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah. Sarah, this relates to what you were talking about earlier, um, closer towards the introduction, about what, what you'd like to see policymakers and educational leaders start doing now. Um, what have you noticed in chat from participants? I know you've been super active in that chat. Um, and how does that relate to what you were saying earlier? Yeah, so um, I think one thing that's come up a couple of times that I would love to see is as you're designing these policies, can you please in include teachers and assessment designers and students and parents um, so that when you're when you're grappling with what's important, you have perspectives of various stakeholders uh, helping to inform the policies that are written. Um, another just caution there is technological advancements are happening so rapidly and I do uh, want us to be competitive with that 
um, but they're outpacing the, the guardrails right now. And so if, if we can just be careful about um, which ones are recommended and how they're uh, incorporated into schools, that would make me feel a lot better. Um, and then back to kind of those four points that I was saying early, and I'm gonna put them in chat here, but these are the, the, the four kind of directions that I would like to see it go, especially in regards to um, assessment. I really want to see those messy cognitive uh, domains represented. Um, I really want to transi transition towards these skills that right now are not valued in the educational system because they're not easy to measure. So we've got to get to the place where uh, we can start to measure them so they become more valued and they become more a part of the conversation inside of classrooms. Um, also towards the, the uh, less formal but value added assessments um, towards the, that assessment for learning, the formative assessment. I think that is so great. I'm so happy that we were talking about that predominantly today. And then towards that stealthy ongoing assessment um, with those authentic learning opportunities, whether that be simulations of what actual professionals are doing. I know it, in Dragon's paper, he talked also about virtual internships, which I thought was a fascinating idea. I really love that. Um, and just these more uh, realistic opportunities for students to engage and grapple with that tend to be a little less sanitized, a little less, oh, this is only relevant inside these four walls. Um, I wanna see students actually engaged in, uh, in real work. And, and I've had students do that before who are actually you know, answering the call of the SDGs from the United Nations. So they are capable and, and, and able to do that, um, but we have to value that work as it's done. And I'm happy to talk about any more of that when we have more time. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm monitoring the poll and invite others to uh, enter their thoughts into the poll. We see some of your thoughts here in chat, so that's great. Keep those coming. Um, in the poll, we see a request for more grant funding, and that's been upvoted. Um, so if anyone else wants to go into the poll, please do. But I'm going to turn it over to Alina. What have you been noticing um, in the chat uh, that you'd like to highlight? Thank you so much, Patty. I did notice a comment about not us in our conversation, at least, not being uh, sufficiently centered on the learning learner themselves. And I think it's a good point. Uh, I don't think it's true about our work. I think it's just uh, that the conversation went more into the direction of policies and teachers. Actually, I would say, given what I know about my colleagues here's work, all of our work is about the individual learners. So <laughs> pretty much we, we are primarily focused on the learner and all of these products that were developed and all this research that was done was about um, how can we make the experience more, um, uh, we call it actually now at Duolingo, we call it delightful. How can we make it easier for test takers to experience an assessment, remove as many obstacles as possible? Or how can we make them um, go through an assessment um, in a shorter period of time using adaptive algorithms, for example, so that they don't have to sit for a long time and take a lot of items that might or questions that might not be relevant to the level of ability they are in. Um, how can we better provide feedback in real time so that they can actually use that information so that they feel that the assessment was valuable to them uh, and not just something that comes in a few months later. <laughs> By that time, everybody forgot what the assessment was about. So embedding um, uh, the assessment in the learning process as a formative experience definitely is focused on the learner. So perhaps we haven't said that in, enough in this conversation, but I know from uh, my colleagues that this is a focus for all of us. I think Sarah has uh, her hand up. Thank you. Wanna, um, go ahead, Sarah. I just want to point out something that was mentioned earlier, too, that assessment is most meaningful whenever it's the choice of the person who's learning to receive that feedback. And so, Megan, I think you're exactly right. And I agree with what you're saying. Megan. Thank you. I'm going to go uh, to Diego, and then we'll, we'll jump over to Dragan and Janice. Diego? Uh, what did you notice uh, about uh, 
the recommendations in chat that you'd like to highlight? Um, I want to highlight some of the ideas uh, mentioned that have been mentioned here as well in terms of uh, being able to create these systems from uh, and providing teachers the information that they need to be able to make the right decisions or, or and um, knowing that teachers are time is limited um, and being able to uh, provide the insights that are needed so we can help in the process rather than overwhelm them with lots of data and and um, I, uh, uh, and being able to to provide those insights in ways that that are meaningful to them um so um i i like the discussion also on on humans in the loop but also making sure that 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 ai centered uh, uh, principles are are involved uh, so we know also thinking about culture, the cultures that we the, we are uh, involving and, and and we are designing with them in in ways that we can highlight aspects. Uh, one in particular, the, the, when I think it was Sarah who mentioned the idea of focusing on skills that are not the ones that we usually assess, and there is lots of opportunities to provide and provide support to help people uh, uh, improve or, or develop some of the skills that they're going to need for the future. Thank you, Diego. Uh, Dragan, what, what would you like to add and highlight? Yeah, no, th thanks so much. I noticed one of the points here that are also emerging is with respect to kind of authentic assessment. And Sarah already touched on some of the points as well I wanted to make here, but I think where we are seeing with respect to the use of AI to have a bit more authenticity in assessment is related to simulation-based learning. And that simulation-based learning can be happening both in a person or kind of offline and online environments. One of those environments that we also collaborated on with, it's actually developed by David Schaefer's group at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and they are kind of supporting these virtual in in internships where learners are immersed into professional, simulated professional practice that is relatively safe. They have plenty of the discussions with different stakeholders, with also different organizational partners, with their simulated boss and many other things. And they need to engage into the process of, uh, in a way, kind of working on that whole simulation and then the AI is helping their identify a range of different processes, a range of different skills that are essential for learners to emerge and immerse in that practice. And to me, this is really helpful because uh, it offers learners a relatively safe environment in which they can also get continuous feedback from a range of stakeholders, including the AI. The other is also we are doing lots of that with the medical and nursing uh, uh, education I mean the physical simulations and teamwork and the way how teams can be doing these type of things. And to us, when we are doing these type of um, uh, things that are relevant, we are also thinking about creating the dashboards for the learners and for the educators. And, and when I previously mentioned and also responding also to the good point Alina mentioned about, you know, us thinking about learners always, even when we are creating the dashboards for the educators, we are evolving the learners in the co-design process. And to me, that's really important so that all other relevant stakeholders become aware or, or you get their input as well into the values that you are trying to embed into some of these AI tools. So, and to me, that, that's really, really critical point. So whether we are talking about the authenticity of that assessment and also the information that is getting collected and inferred as part of that exercise. Thank you so much, Dragan. Yeah. Jeremy? Yeah, well, I see Janice has her hand raised, so I want to give her some, a little bit of time, and then I want to come to Christina and ask her, you know, Christina, what do you what do you think about these recommendations you're seeing? But let's go to Janice first, and she has her hand up. Thanks, Jeremy. I was just going to make a really quick uh, point uh, reflecting on a, um, what Dragan said and also what Sarah said and some uh, comments in the chat. 
about how we could use AI to move the nature of, of teaching and learning in schools. So it is the case, um, unfortunately, though we can leverage from this, that what gets assessed is what will be focused on in instruction, mm -hmm. right? So if we have assessments that are more oriented around processes, deep thinking, creativity, uh, inference making, uh, real problem solving, trial and error, et cetera, if we have assessments like that and we have AI like that, those are the things that will get emphasized in instruction. And this will also create um, more agency in students. I saw that Jack, uh, Jacqueline Okenpa um, measured, uh, mentioned agency. And I think that's really important. Students need to have agency in their own learning, in, um, in thinking about what do I know? What don't I know? What do I need to do to get from where I am to where I, where I want to go? And um, so I'm a Carl Bereiter, Marlene Scardamalia graduate from University of Toronto, who, who really um, coined the term intentional learning. And I think when we can get back to students taking on agency and intentionality with regard to uh, their own learning, we will actually improve um, our um, our state of our knowledge in the U.S., you know, our state of our, our performance in the U.S. relative to other countries. Take Finland, right? Finland is doing extremely well, but you see much more agency in the students than, um, and much more agency in the instruction than you do here in the U.S. So I think that's a key point, and I think AI can be used in a way to move the ecology of instruction, because what gets um, assessed is what will be focused on in instruction. So that's just a quick comment about that. That's great. I appreciate the the thoughts there, especially bringing bringing it back to the learner. Um, I did see that comment in the chat, and and several folks kind of plus wanting that. And we do want to make sure that learners are included in this. When we talk about human in the loop, we do default to educators or the leaders that are making those decisions. But how do we make sure that that our learners are involved in this as well? Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm a former early childhood teacher. And so I think of those, those think alouds and that really of the metacognitive um, kind of practices where we're talking through or thinking aloud, um, we, we tend to lose that by about third or fourth grade. Um, so how can we start to think about that within the context of using some of these tools? Um, so it's certainly something for, for us to think about, but I do appreciate everyone's kind of thoughts here to this question and the more of the frameworks and providing we we say like capital G guidance and then lowercase g guidance because there are certain publications that we can responsibly and statutorily put out, but then there's also a difference um, in conversations with educators and leaders that we can have around the guidance that we can certainly provide. Again, we, we talked about the professional learning and ways to fund that, but also making sure that that actually happens. We have to build awareness of the, the fact that AI is already in classrooms for educator, uh, the, excuse me, the leaders that are making decisions about the professional learning to make sure that they're also building that into their um, kind of their forecasted learning that they're providing for their schools. So, um, and then of course the funding mechanism I also threw this in the chat. Um, I wish that I controlled the budget. Trust me, I really do. Um, <laughs> but I, we we don't. We simply don't. Um, we execute on on the budget or the 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 dollars that we are given. And so we are limited just like so many of you are in your respective states and schools. Um, and so we try to do as much as we can and stretch that dollar, but we are um, we are limited. So please know that we are trying to to maximize that um, and advocate whenever possible um, for research and development, for you know, rapid cycle evaluations to be different, especially when we're talking about ed tech um, and making sure that AI is a part of that. And like massive investments are happening through IES, which is affiliated with the Department of Education, the Institute for Educational Sciences, as well as our partners at NSF, National Science Foundation, but making sure that we're also part of that on the policy side to be able to present the this, um, you know, as a complete package to everyone. Thanks so much, Christina. We're, we're going to move towards wrapping up now, but I see, Dragon, you have your hand up. Is there something you wanted to get in? Maybe I just wanted to make one final quick point and uh, Christina, remind me of. 
And that's the fact that we live in a time where AI is used everywhere from the search engine to everything. So I think we should not be keeping AI out of the classrooms, but instead we should be basically thinking about best learning and teaching practices that that AI can be put into the safe hands of our learners and how learners can basically safely be interacting and using that AI, but also understanding the threats and other issues that are related to AI. So that's the final point. I just want to make a very quick concern. Jeremy, you want to wrap up? Thanks so much. And you know, um, this really is happening internationally, which is why it was so important to have someone from Australia in this case. We are also actively listening to and talking to our colleagues in Asia, in the UK, in Israel, in all parts of the world. Um, we find colleagues working on these issues. So um, really important. So I want to do some thank yous. I want to thank, first of all, our participants. The conversation in chat the conversation in the polls has been exceptionally rich. We will be paying attention to those conversations. Second, I want to invite Christina to thank our panelists. If I can get to the right button, there we go. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, um, your, your thoughts. Um, it really will influence the work that we have um, to do after this. This is our fourth listening session. We have so much to synthesize and summarize and distill into a brief that will be coming this fall. Um, please keep your eye out for that and know that while we certainly are thinking about it from the policy perspective within the Department of Education, we are not the only ones that are focused on this. The White House is deeply interested in AI right now to make sure that we are providing those guardrails and guidelines um, for developers um, to make sure that our general public is safe um, when we use these, these technologies. So thank you again for your expertise. We, uh, we look forward to putting this all together into um, a new publication. And I, I want to go to our closing slide because it has a link that says where you can continue to provide input into our listening form and that you can follow on, on Twitter, the Office of EdTech. You can follow Digital Promise and stay in touch with what's going on as we move to synergize, pull together, synthesize all your input, work with our colleagues at the Department of Ed on this policy brief. And I just know the policy brief is going to call for more and more engagement and, and conversation. So this is uh, much more of a beginning than it is an ending. And finally, last thank you. Thank you to all my colleagues at Digital Promise who make this possible. Some of them are behind the scenes like Gabrielle and Judy and many others helping us get the word out. Only possible through the efforts of all of you. So thanks so much for attending. We look forward to hearing more from you.